I truly appreciate the opportunity, and it's a hard act to follow you know, from what the accelerator stuff you just saw. And also, it's the afternoon after lunch. It's hard to stay awake, so hopefully I'll keep it interesting. Right? So what are we looking at? You know, what does sharing devices across multiple virtual machines, why does it matter? Right? So if you look at HPC, traditionally, it's all been bare metal. What, uh, that is, you know, your virtualization has not broken into HPC as much as it has done in other enterprise applications. So for it, uh, the, biggest the biggest issues are obviously, you know, first thing that comes across is performance. You know, you know how can, can it perform the same way? And the other aspect is, you know, why do I have to go virtualize it, right? And a lot of the talks, talks early in the morning, like uh, Ohio State and others, they mentioned that virtualization has to happen because of everything being cloudified, a private cloud or public cloud, all these environments use virtualization. So you need to be able to use virtualization even in HPC, but a lot of the things that are unique to HPC, particularly the speed and the interconnects, need to be shareable for this to be usable, right? So that's kind of what my topic is. My topic is to see, show you the type of technology that is available right now that one can leverage and that makes HPC virtualization a reality. So, so how is it different from, you know, VMware, uh, for example, VMware is a virtualization leader. A lot of things have already been virtualized, like networking and all that, but if you look at uh, some of the um, things that involve in enterprise applications, it's, uh, things are happening in milliseconds, so that's okay. That's easy to virtualize. There's no impact of uh, overhead on it, right? Uh, milliseconds are you know, manageable, but in the world of HPC, things operate in micro and nanoseconds. So how do you kind of uh, translate from that world where uh, virtualization was, is prevalent, which is enterprise apps, to HPC, where the, the speeds are much, um, thousand times faster, actually, so, right? So, so like, like as you know, um, you know, what HPC is used in like science and research, finance, machine learning, and uh, big data. So we want to be able to adapt uh, the virtualization solution to match these needs. So these applications usually, uh, you know, uh, latency is the is is king. So we need to be able to share the. If you want to share devices across virtual machines, you need to make sure that. Uh, you know, the, the, the expectations of latency that HPC applications have are met, right? So I'll go through uh, some technologies out there that makes, it, makes this happen, and also some uh, common uh, applications, like we already saw uh, some Spark-related um, presentations, so a little bit on Spark, and also in the end, we'll look at uh, GPU and how GPUs can be shared. So a lot of this... Um, Sharing has been actually enabled by our partners, like I'm gonna talk about Mellanox and NVIDIA. And this, uh, the, this is based on work from my colleague, uh, Josh Simmons and uh, Aviad from Mellanox, right? So direct device access. So what if you can take a virtual machine running in a virtual environment and make, give it direct access to the device? That means have no layer between the virtual machine and the device. So that's kind of the simplest way. But what it, what it gives you is it gives you native performance. The only drivers you install is the drivers and the guest, and the guest directly talks to, 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 to the, we use something called direct path IO, so uh, the guest is able to talk directly to the PCI device and it's able to get the performance that a bare metal gives you, right? It is fast, uh, performance is good, but there are some limitations. Virtualization has a lot of advantages, like mobility and stuff like that. All those things, all those paradigms break when you give direct access. Because now, particularly with this methodology, only one VM, let's say you have multiple VMs in a particular physical host, only one VM is able to use the host. So you're getting the performance, but you're losing a lot of the flexibility, right? So, but the be beauty about this is, you know, you can get, um, uh, native performance and some of the, but some of the features like vMotion, like moving things across and then snapshots are lost. 
And it, uh, simplicity is that there's no driver required, it's just the driver at the OS level that you use, right? So the next aspect is can we partition this device in any way, right? So that is kind of what virtualization has done for a long time, right? It's able to partition the CPU, break up the CPU, the memory, and the hardware, and give it across multiple VMs, right? And so if you can do the same thing with these devices, then you have a good solution. You have a potential solution that can be leveraged. So, so SRIOV is one such a technology where actually you take a piece of hardware and uh, if, you have, if the hardware is SRIOV capable, then what happens is you are breaking up the device into multiple virtual devices that each VM can individually be assigned to. And by doing that, you have sharing, right? And so, uh, so th these things leverage, uh, you know, SRIV from uh, infinite band and, uh, and can also work over Rocky, which is like the, uh, the converged Ethernet interconnects, right? So here you see that, you know, by doing that, you don't need to give direct access. You're giving a, a, a virtual access to a, uh, and then you're sharing the device. So one of the important things that uh, you know, uh, has come about is this RDMA standard, right? The RDMA uh, is, a is, is a capability. It's a standard that lets you move data to and from memory. So that means you can actually interact, have machines, memory interact with each other without the traditional overhead you are associated with. So things like, you know, in, the, in the past, if you use TCP IP, things are much, uh, you know, there are a lot of overhead associated with taking a packet, packaging it up in a TCP IP frame and sending it across, right? With uh, RDMA, uh, you know, a lot of these latencies are reduced and it's all done in hardware, right? And so some of the common things that have come across recently are in storage, there is uh, ICER, which is iSCSI over um, infinite band, uh, NFS RDMA, it's NFS over, and then Luster and other things. All these are compatible with RDMA. Right, and it's it's useful in MPI and SS shared mem applications and big data applications. So the thing I want to talk about, sh show you here is, uh, you see that um, you know we are showing you comparison between uh, TCP/IP based. Uh, this this kind of shows you uh, how long it takes for a number of nodes to solve a problem, and you see that um, the um, the uh, infinite band scales well as uh, the TCP doesn't. Even if the, even with the speed increasing, you see that uh, there's a, this is because of the, you know, the, the overhead kind of overwhelms the, even though you might have a bigger pipe, because of the overhead of TCP IP, you're losing a lot of performance. And here you see that uh, the infinite band portion scales linearly. Right? And so now let's look at how does RDMA achieve this performance, right? And so if you look at, um, RDMA, right, it, uh, traditionally you have, uh, you know, there's a kernel in between the user and the device. In the case of RDMA, actually the, the, the user space directly talks to the hardware. And, it, uh, and, 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 the, uh, and that gives you, like, things, it gives you capabilities like it isolates between applications, it packets, packet, uh, packetizes the messages, and there's also address translation. Because there's a direct path between the user space and the hardware, uh, the, there's a lot of overhead that's reduced. And so, so RDMA is kind of the, uh, provides this capability to kind of uh, give you high performance, right? So at, the, at a VMware level, how do you leverage RDMA, right? And so I, I've already talked about SRIOV, so if you leverage SRIOV and uh, you, uh, and pro deploy you know, infinite, infinite band bundle on a VMware environment, you're able to leverage RDMA and leverage SRIOV to, to share the, the hardware across multiple devices. And here we're showing you, once you've deployed, deployed uh, you know, the SRIOV, this is how you see that, you can see that there are multiple virtual functions available, right? That means this is one device, there's one PCI device, and you see so many, uh, so, many, uh, uh, so many pieces of it, and that each piece can be allocated to a particular virtual machine. And so that's kind of how you share, right? And then you can take that virtual function and allocate it to a particular virtual machine, and now that virtual machine's using the hardware as if it's local, 
but it's, it's actually shared across multiple virtual machines, right? So let's look at a few examples. Um, uh, so we, we, did, we did an analysis of Spark, and then uh, so we ran uh, typical Spark benchmarks. We have a 16-node cluster here uh, with one server used as a name node, and then we have uh, infinite band uh, connectivity between all the nodes, and we kind of compared TCP IP versus RDMA, and you see that there's a significant improvement in performance when you go, go RDMA, and not only that, RDMA is the closest thing to bare metal. That means the performance in RDMA, we, and we also ran it on bare metal, and it's all, uh, the difference is less than 2 to 3%. So that's kind of a, a very tolerable overhead, but at the same time, you have, you have all these things sharing these devices, right? So, so now let's move on to high-performance computing. And so when you look at HPC clusters, there are two kinds. There's this throughput kind where... Uh, it's uh, like uh, uh, an earlier speaker said, it is embarrassingly parallel, so a lot of, it can scale horizontally and it, it, can, it can scale to as many as thousands and thousands of devices, or it can be where it is all tightly coupled. The MPI is, uh, most of the talks I've seen today is all mostly based on MPI, which is massively parallel computing, right? And all these things need to be tightly coupled. And for virtualization, the biggest challenge is not the throughput workloads because that is horizontal scaling, easily manageable. When it comes to tightly coupled, that's where you need, you know, milliseconds will not work for you. You need to have high speed connects and you need to be able to share these, share these devices in a very, um, uh, you know, with very little overhead, right? So, so now let's look at uh, an infinite band SRIOE MPI example. So what, what we are showing you here is, okay, let's, let's go back one step. So typically in bare metal, this, rep this we can say is represents bare metal. There's one VM per host, and, and each host has got only, and, and then there's no over-provisioning. That means uh, each host has only one VM, and it's got direct connectivity in for infinite band, and let's say nobody, since nobody else is using it, it, gets, it has direct access to infinite band. It gets the whole bandwidth. Right? We take this, and in, the, in a typical uh, virtualization world, we always over-provision. Right? We look at inefficiencies. A lot of times, even though you might have a lot of capacity, a lot of times they're underutilized. So virtualization's main value prop is if you are underutilized, we can make, it, we can make you use all your hardware. Right? So here, this is a typical bare metal, representative of a bare metal um, cluster. Right? And so you get, you, you get everything, is, there's nothing, no provisioning, and you, have, you, you kind of get uh, direct. Pro but let's say uh, sometimes during the day or during your cycle, there's, a, there's some cycles that are freed up and all, these, all the hardware is not being used. So let's say we over provision and have a similar, and we say, let's say we two is to one over provisioning, where you have two clusters. These two are two different HPC clusters, uh, with the, which will run the same workload. And we'll see how, if you, if you do this, how can we, we'll run some workloads on it and see how it, does it help or not, right? So, so what we did was we ran these, uh, these, uh, these benchmarks and the, the application. And so on bare metal, this application, a single instance of this application ran in 93.4 seconds, right? We ran this on just layering virtualization on top of it and we ran it, it came 98.5. That was, this is like a couple of years old, we've gotten it much closer, okay, but this is the overhead, right? This is the overhead. And then now, we, what we did was we ran it across two clusters, two jobs, right? So we are doing this in 170 seconds, right? Both the jobs finished in 170 seconds. But if I ran in bare metal, I have to sequence my jobs. I have to do 93.4 and then again another 93.4. So what, it's, what, I'm, what we see here is, by virtualizing, you actually save 10%. There is a caveat here. Of course, if you are a user of the system, and if you expect your stuff to run in 93.4, and if two jobs are running at the same time, as a user, you'll see some inconsistencies. There is a, it sometimes it could take double the time, or sometimes it could take, uh, you know, it, so it depends on who's using the system. When you have a shared system, in, like in a virtualization, you're going to have uh, you know, when there's contention, you're going to have unpredictable times for your jobs. But if you look at a throughput from an infrastructure standpoint, you are gaining. 
So that's kind of where, uh, you know, if you look at a uh, lot of uh, organizations running HPC, you can gain through virtualization, but there, is, there are some caveats and you should make sure that your users are aware that, you know, the, the end result is that you are gaining, but sometimes your jobs could take longer, right? So the, the last thing I want to talk about is actually compute accelerators, right? Yeah. See, uh, we, can, we can partition the CPU and memory resources, and not, not necessarily the, the card itself. To some extent, the card partitioning, actually, you'll see that in GPUs, too. See, uh, NVIDIA Grid provides you such, some capabilities, but it's kind of, uh, right now, it's, it's limited in the sense, it, it depends on the model you choose and all that. But there's the same kind of fair share scheduling you see in a lot of places is available in, in virtualization as well. So, so that kind of, that's kind of where you, you give the first compute cluster more shares than the second compute cluster, or twice the shares, and then it'll be twice as fast. Right? And so now, if you look at, um, so the, the, the thing about NVIDIA is over the past uh, few years, um, you know, the, the HPC community has uh, realized that you know, GPUs can be used for other things than just graphics, right? And so that's become the big thing. And now, uh, so it provides you the framework to share, um, NVIDIA has given you the framework to share GPUs as well. You might have GPU cards in your servers, but you don't want just one person to use that, uh, one process, one person or a process to use the hardware, right? You want to be able to share it. And so that's kind of where, you know, uh, and, and NVIDIA has got this grid technology where you're able to share these uh, resources, right? And so there are a lot of different ways you can share, and uh, this is kind of uh, going up on the question you asked. So you can actually choose the sharing policy. So there is a fixed share. When you do a fixed share, let's say um, I have one GPU card, and I want to share it across four virtual machines. So I get one-fourth, and right now NVIDIA allows you to do only equal sharing. So I'll get one-fourth the share for each VM. And what it does is it does uh, GPU slicing and it kind of uh, gives uh, one fourth of the memory of the GPU to each of those VMs, right? And now if I give a fixed share, let's say I have four VMs and I give each VM one fourth of the share. Let's say a couple of the VMs are idle. They're not doing anything. Since I've already given a fixed share that 50% of the, of the GPU is not used and nobody else can use it as well. So that's, that's a fixed share model. Equal share is where every, every VM has a, um, you know, equal dibs on the GPU, but again, you are not able to prioritize. So, and, the, and the best effort is where actually if something needs more, it gets it more, and something needs less, it gets less. So based on your own environment, you would choose one over the other, right? And so that's, the, that's GPU sharing, and, and here I'm gonna show you an example of a job, right? And the, 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 the red job is the one that's a longer running job, and the, the black, these are two different uh, jobs running on the GP, uh, uh, in a shared sense on the GPU, right? And then, you, you, and we're using this, uh, what do you call, the best effort here. So when you use best effort, what happens is, and also we've kind of split it up in such a way that 65% of the, GPU goes to the first job and the second one gets 35% here, right? And then you see that this, uh, the second job tapers off after like uh, 1,500 seconds, right? And so you automatically see that the red job gets more GPU until it, and, and it, it is able to use it. So you can see that even in a shared environment uh, with best effort like um, sharing, you're able to actually, you, you're able to use this in a flexible manner so that the jobs that need it for a short time, they get it, and the jobs that need it for a longer time get, get, uh, are limited for some time, but uh, over a long time, they actually get, get the resources that they need, right? So, so that this kind of shows you how the, the, the GPU computing stuff works. So uh, in summary, um, I, we can, we've seen, yeah, go ahead.
So this one, we actually didn't, we, 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 we ran them together uh, just to showcase, you know, we wanted to run a job that runs, finishes quickly and a job that finish. So, but we have run a lot of tests uh, um, in, in different scenarios where, you know, sometimes in sequence, like I showed you earlier in the SRIOA example, uh, the bare metal stuff was sequential, whereas the, um, the, the two, two cluster stuff was parallel, right? So, and the other things is a lot of the results we see, you know, what we did was to compare it to bare metal, we did one, one VM per node, and that's usually not what we recommend. We sometimes, a lot of times we recommend one VM per NUMA node. And that way what happens is uh, your VM re resides within a NUMA boundary, and then that gives you better performance. And so when we do those kinds of things, actually uh, virtualization actually improves performance sometimes. You get better performance and throughput. And then the whole purpose of it is, it, it is to actually, if you take a, a set of hardware, you want as much performance as you can and as many jobs finishing in, as, as you can. So that's kind of what, what these things have shown, right? And so in summary, right, we've seen that, you know, um, you, can, you, can, you can have high performance devices that can be shared. It doesn't need to be, uh, it doesn't need to be dedicated. Not only that, you, are, you actually gain by sharing. Your traditional VM virtualization advantages that you have by sharing, you get, get because you have those new technologies that NVIDIA, Mellanox, and all the other partners are developing. And then uh, you, we've seen things like uh, deep learning with GPGPUs and uh, big data with uh, Apache Spark that, uh, that you know, the performance of virtual environments is almost similar to, to bare metal environments and you don't lose much there. So that's, that's what I have. Any questions? The security is uh, the, the the security aspects. It, it, you know, there are there is security in the protocol in the in the standard. So, no, yeah, the, the hardware the hardware uh, has boundaries, creates boundaries, and it mediates the infinite band hardware or the Rocky hardware mediates mediates and creates uh, secure channels for different user level processes that communicate with it. So there is no sharing. So that's, that's, that's what you depend on in this situation. Does GPU sharing look like uh, Arcuda? Have you tried Arcuda as well for this? I mean, Arcuda is intercepting the CUDA calls, so in a sentence, intercepting the CUDA calls and so that you can use the remote host for, uh, for GPU workloads. It looks similar to yeah. Yeah, exactly. So remote host, so this technology can, uh, with RDMA, you can also leverage uh, remote, remote CUDA and remote calls. And uh, uh, what, the, in the, what is evolving is what we see initially here is within the host, you're sharing GPUs. But imagine a cluster of nodes, all of them have their own GPUs. Imagine wanting to use a GPU across the interconnects. You can do that. Yeah. Not, it's not, not you, you, you would be able to do that in the future. It's not there yet. You could do that, but you know there is obviously latencies and other issues that need to be solved. Yeah, but there is a product. Yeah, there is a product that. Are, yeah, yeah. So that, that's where you know RDMA comes in, right? Uh, this, we have something called vRDMA, uh, with, with the latest version of VMware vSphere has. So with vRDMA, you can actually even move machines that are running on RDMA across nodes, and uh, and that that me. Uh, so, so, but you need obviously very high-end infrastructure for it to, for it to work, like uh, obviously the infinite band and the fastest speeds. But, uh, but uh, yeah, th this technology is, uh, SRIOE is also bound to some extent right now because it's bound, uh, the virtual functions are within a node and not across the cluster. 
So with RDMA, you can, you can move things around and stuff like that. Absolutely, I agree. Um, so that's what, if you, what I've shown you with the NVIDIA grid, right? The NVIDIA gives you the ability to virtualize the, the GPU, just like uh, vSphere can virtualize the traditional CPU. And so by having high-speed pass-throughs with all these different capabilities, you are able to do that. But these are in the starting phases compared to what CPU and memory virtualization in the traditional sense are. Thank you very much.